Hi everyone, this is Tim, your Block 1 Lecture Instructor, and today we're going to cover Chapter 31, which is Activity and Exercise. The learning outcomes for this PowerPoint are going to be use proper body mechanics when providing patient care, compare the effects of exercise and immobil immobility on the body, describe activities to promote fitness and health, identify patients at risk for immobility, concerns, or activity intolerance, Develop a plan of care for patients with impaired mobility or activity intolerance. Implement measures to promote activity and exercise, which are going to include positioning, moving, transferring, and ambulating patients. Use mechanical aids to properly move your patients. And finally, describe how to properly use mobility-assisted devices. So for activity and exercise, this involves mobility. It's the interaction of bones, muscles, and nervous system. It involves body mechanics, uh, which is the way people move. This will include body alignment, balance, coordination, and joint mobility. So for body alignment, uh, we have uh, body alignment or posture is an important aspect of good body mechanics. Uh, proper posture maintains the natural curves of the spine and normal functioning of the nervous system. And if you look on page uh, 753, uh, posture problems are caused by accidents and injuries and falls, careless sitting, standing, or sleeping habits, excessive weight, foot problems or improper shoes, negative self-image, and occupational stress. And so for balance, uh, for the body to be balanced, your line of gravity must pass through your center of gravity, and your center of gravity must be close to your base of support. So if you look on page 754, uh, figure 31-4, uh, with a wide stance, the center of gravity is closer to the base of support, and with a narrow stance, the body is less stable. So I think that's a pretty good picture of uh, um, the ability to uh, balance yourself is to have your uh, feet at a wide stance. So it kind of gives you more support and, uh, and balance. So we also have uh, coordination um, and we also have joint mobility. Uh, we have range of motion, which is the maximum movement possible. We have active range of motion, uh, range of motion, which is movement of the joint through the entire range of motion. And then we have passive range of motion, which is moving joints through the entire range of motion, but with help. And I think that's it. So principles of body mechanics: uh, to move your body without causing injury, you need proper alignment, you need wide base of support, avoid bending and twisting, um, squat to lift. Keep objects close when lifting. Raise the beds. Um, I, I think this is probably the biggest thing that nurses um, do as far as a disservice to themselves. As you go in the room, you either do an assessment, an IV, or NG tube, Foley catheters. Um, you know, there's a million things we do all day long that if we just raise the bed to our level, it would keep us from having to bend over all day long. Um, that puts a lot of stress on your back. So keep this in mind when you're doing clinicals. Um, you know, when you're doing anything, just raise the bed. It's it's going to save your back. I've been a nurse for about 10 years, um, and I just never really believed it. And I thought, you know what, I'm young and I'm strong. I should be able to do it. But uh, 10 years later, my back's not killing me, but I think it probably would be a little less sore if uh, I raised the bed a lot. <clears throat> Um, you want to push instead of lift. Um, if you're moving your patient from either the bed to a gurney or um, you're repositioning your patient, it's easier to push than it is to actually pull um, and always get help. Um, I, I think I've, out of my 10 years of, of nursing, I don't think I've ever had anybody say, no, I'm not going to be able to help you. Um, purposely. Um, but I think if you find somebody just to kind of help you real quick, a lot of times people will just do that for you. Um, we have exercise. There's contraction and relaxation of muscles, uh, increases muscle tone and strength. And as far as uh, working out, um, I actually wrote down um, 150 to 250 minutes, which turns out to be two and a half hours to four hours um, of exercise a week uh, for moderate and vigorous intensity exercises recommended. the more uh, exercise we do uh, as nurses, the the more it strengthens the muscles that we use every day. Um, and it's funny because I, I used to think, well, I'm always walking. 
and I'm always squatting and I'm always lifting and I'm always doing these things that work in a 12 hour period. So who needs to go to the gym? But I also think that if you actually go to the gym and, and not necessarily work out to become muscular and strong and, and big and bulky and all other stuff. Um, but I think if you actually, um, you know, lift to become stronger, um, do exercises and, and range of motions and, and stretches and things like that, I think that it makes you stronger so you can do your job better and last longer. Because um, let me tell you, nursing, um, I love my job. I love helping. I love doing, my, you know, my patient care. And I love doing what I do. And I just do it because I need to, but um, I think that exercising and lifting and, and making yourself um, just physically stronger allows you to do it better for a longer period of time. So I think it's important. So there's types of exercises. Uh, there's uh, isometric, which is muscle contraction without motion. There's isotonic, uh, which is movement of the joint during the muscle contraction. Um, according to the book, and I think this is probably the easiest way to remember it, it's really just free weights. Um, we've got isokinetic, uh, which is variable resistance. Um, this is the machines you would use at the gym. Um, when I go to the gym, I like to actually use the machines because they're a little more stable. I could read a direction, it tells me how to do it, and I just do it. Uh, with free weights, in my gym, usually it's a, a separation. In fact, the floor is separated. Um, you have carpet on the side that has the machines, and then you've got mats for the uh, free weights, and that's where all the big bulky guys work out and stuff. It's a little intimidating. But with uh, free weights, there's um, less structure to it, so you're actually doing more of a range of motion. Uh, with aerobic exercises, it's more, to me, jumping around to the gym and doing jazzercise and, and that sense of stuff. So, um, but according to the book, it actually, you know, use more O2 and you um, inhale as much as you actually need, which with, with anaerobic exercise, it's, it's more sprinting and you inhale less oxygen based on the more activity that you do. So benefits of exercise, it improves cardiovascular health, increases muscle tone and flexibility, enhances the immune system, promotes weight loss, and decreases stress and increases overall feeling of well-being. Um, I try to go to the gym at least, you know, every other day or at least a couple times a week. Um, I'm not a fanatic about it. Um, I'm not... Um, you know, I don't jump in the car and drive as fast as I go, you know, I can to get to the gym. Um, but I do like going to the gym and I find that if I don't go um, as often as I would like, I do feel um, a little more stressed out or not so much anxiety, but just I can, I can tell that I miss it. So um, I think if you get yourself on a pattern, it just becomes more habit than anything else. And uh, like I said, when you don't go as often, you kind of, you know, miss it a little bit. So factors affecting mobility and activity. Um, the first one is lifespan in older adults. And if you go to page uh, 716, your volume one book, uh, teaching your older adult patient about increasing physical activity and exercise, uh, the benefits for the older adult, um, I think these are pretty important, um, improves and maintains strength so you can stay independent as long as possible, uh, maintains balance and prevents falls. Um, these two are probably the most important for your um, elderly just because the older you get, the less balance you have and you tend to fall more. Um, and as far as maintaining your strength, older patients want to stay as independent as long as they possibly can. So the more exercise and the stronger they are, um, the healthier they are, the more balance they can maintain, less falls they have, the more they can stay in their home. Um, safely. Um, it gives you more energy to do things that you want to do, uh, helps you sleep better and feel more rested. I tend to actually work out um, after working a 12 hour shift. Um, it sounds a little crazy, but you know, by then you're getting the second wind. I go, I work out, I get done, I sit in the jacuzzi, kind of relax a little bit, then I take a shower and I go home. Um, I've, I'm already hot, I'm already tired, and I'm already showered. So I sleep so much better, and then in the morning, I'm usually waking up before the alarm goes off or if the alarm does go off, I'm not having to hit snooze and I feel um, better rested. So your, your elderly patients are the same way. Uh, you also have nutrition, uh, so you should eat right and exercise. This uh, prevents obesity, which also prevents joint injury and then 
without joint injury, you won't have osteoarthritis. So it's kind of a, a snowball effect. So eat right, exercise, and you prevent a lot of uh, weight-related illnesses. So for with lifestyle, um, uh, because life is easier as far as easier than it was 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, um, with all of the technology, we're not having to physically um, do different jobs on a whole. So with us not having to exercise as much because of our job, um, we should exercise more so we still get some sort of physical activity. So with stress, um, I think that we're all stressed out, um, especially with you guys being in nursing school. Um, I find that when I get stressed out, if I go, go to the gym, I, it kind of relieves the stress. So that helps a little bit. Um, according to the book, it even uses an example of walking. You know, um, you know, just take a study break and go and walk as far as you can. Well, that sounds great. And I think it's a great idea, but uh, um, I think if you actually set time uh, aside for specifically working out, and it doesn't have to be hours. We're talking an hour just to go and get sweaty and and uh, kind of relieve your stress and stuff, and uh, and then come back. I think you might you know clear your head a little bit. There's also uh, environmental factors that affect mobility and activity. Um, it could be the weather. Um, according to the book, they use the uh, the winters. Well, I think with here being 115, 120 degrees outside, uh, nobody wants to go out and run because it's just way too hot. But uh, that's a factor. They have the pollution. We have finances. You know whether or not people can actually afford the gym. Um, the sports systems. Do you actually have someone at home who encourages you to go to the gym, or do you have a gym buddy or somebody who wants to go with you? Um, that kind of helps you know motivate you to go um, and then there's also diseases and abnormalities these are found on page 761 and there's a list of just different um, you know problems that people can have um, that will affect whether or not they can actually work out or mobility or have some sort of activity so effects of immobility um, you have muscle atrophy and joint dysfunction uh, you have renal colliculi uh, you have decreased gas exchange, atelectasis, and ammonia. Um, I think that the more exercise that, whether it be your patients or yourself, do, the more it um, expands the lungs, uh, causes you to take big, deep breaths, um, promotes gas exchange, but it also prevents the pneumonia. I think that you'll find that, um, you know, I'd say the majority of the patients that you have that have contracted pneumonia based on um, immobility or uh, surgeries or things that don't really get them out of bed um, it's because of that that they get pneumonia so we have venous stasis and increased coagula uh, coagulability uh, deep vein thrombosis DVTs um, patients who lay in bed they're not actually moving and the less they move the less muscle contraction they have muscle contraction actually squeezes the blood and, and keeps it moving and keeps it pumping well when that starts to kind of pull a little bit that's when you get the DVTs so if you have a patient who's on Levinox as a prophylactic it's to keep your immobile patients from getting DVTs uh, we have orthostatic hypotension and you have glucose intolerance you also have hormone imbalances. Uh, you have pressure ulcers because if you're not moving, you're laying, and if you lay long enough, eventually skin breaks down, less circulation. Um, if there's less circulation, there's less um, obviously less blood to actually circulate in that area, so that's where the breakdown comes. So um, your patients who are immobile, they're laying in that, we call it the bucket of the bed. Um, it's where their head's a little bit elevated and their legs are down and they kind of, their butt sits in this bucket or the dip of the bed and that's where it, their skin breaks down. Um, immobility also causes constipation. So if you have a patient who has just had recently had surgery, anesthetic uh, slows the peristalsis of the intestines. So that's where, you know, when you're doing your assessments and you're listening, listening to the bowels for um, gas and movement, if there isn't any, getting them up and moving gets circulation to that area and allows things to start moving again. So without the circulation, you get constipated. Uh, urinary tract infection, kidney stones, um, you get depression. I mean, I can imagine, you know, being sick and laying in the bed for two weeks and not being able to get up. Um, I get depressed over a couple of days of having the flu and being in bed for too many days. So uh, depression is a big part of it. Sleep disturbances. Um, if you're laying in bed long enough, eventually you just kind of take nap cat naps all the time and, and your sleep 
pattern gets off. Um, and disorientation, um, that happens a lot with patients, especially older adults. Um, they come to the hospital and they'll get confused just because they fall asleep, they wake up, they're not really quite sure who they are. And, and after a while, that becomes disorienting. So nursing assessments for mobility, um, you can do a focused nursing history, which is found in your volume two book, chapter 31. Um, here you actually find um, suggested history questions uh, for assessing activity and exercise. Uh, you got a focused as a physical assessment, um, which also will uh, get the health history questions and you'll know, assess for their activities and their exercises uh, and a focused physical assessment. So again, you're looking at more skin breakdown, uh, range of motions, you know, what can they do, pushes, pulls, grips, things like that. Uh, you got functional independent measures. Um, you know, can your patient actually get out of bed? Can they walk to the bathroom? Can they walk to, you know, a chair? Can they do these things? Because if they can't, they can't safely go home, um, which, you know, uh, brings you to gait. Um, if you have an elderly patient and you're assessing them, they can't quite seem to do as much as they could have when they're independent at home. Get in order for physical therapy as soon as possible. Have them working with them and getting them up and walking and, and getting their strength back because the longer you lay in bed, the weaker you get. And that causes activity tolerance. So nursing diagnosis. You have activity intolerance. You have impaired physical mobility, you have risk for disuse syndrome, sedentary lifestyle, um, as the causes could be acute pain related to muscle skeletal injury, ineffective health maintenance related to bed rest, and risk for injury related to unsteady gait. So nursing measures to promote activity and exercise. Uh, promote exercise, you want to plan and vary exercise routine. Um, you don't have to get them up and out of bed and, and do every single exercise at once. You can do them throughout the day so they don't uh, tire as easily. Use the buddy system and rewards. Um, get help. Um, have family, friends, people to actually learn how to do these things so when they do go home, they can actually help them, uh, you know, whether it be, act, you know, uh, range of motion exercises or walking or getting from bed to the chair. I mean, it, they're going to go home and they need some sort of encouragement. Integrate exercise into routine activities, um, reorganize or recognize and appreciate success. So if your patient can walk a few feet, whereas the day before they couldn't walk at all, um, you know, um, tell them how well they're doing, um, congratulate them and kind of encourage them because uh, the stronger they get, the, the faster they're able to get out of the hospital. So nursing measures to promote activity and exercise, uh, position your patients, uh, proper alignment and use of hospital beds. Um, you also have incorporation of pillows, wedges, side rails, overhead trapeze, and footboards. Um, I think that the overhead trapeze, is, which is probably the third picture, I think it's probably the most unused um, piece of equipment that can be used in the hospital. Um, patients who can't necessarily um, move or adjust themselves or uh, reposition themselves, their trapeze allows them to kind of lift their body up enough that they're able to kind of scoot a little bit um, because the beds aren't the easiest thing for patients, especially that are very weak, to be able to readjust themselves. So the trapeze allows them to kind of use their upper body strength to kind of reposition. Uh, we've got uh, sandbags, trochanter rolls, uh, splints, hip abduction pillows, and boots. Um, so uh, again, the patient who is stuck in bed can still always benefit from some sort of range of motion exercises that you as the nurse uh, can perform. So it keeps those things moving, keeps the circulation moving, and keeps um, you know things kind of working. Uh, let's see here we have uh, positioning new patients to so common positions. We have high fallers, uh, fallers, and semi fallers. Uh, we've got the lateral, prone, sims, and subline, which these pictures all uh, demonstrate all those things. So I find that, uh, let's see here, your patient is probably going to be um, this one right here. Your patient in the hospital usually is in this position. Uh, if you either put a pillow under their legs or under their knees, or at least raise the foot of the bed a little higher, it um, it allows them to kind of get a little bit more circulation as opposed to just pulling into that you know area right about here, and that's where I called it the bucket. 
So moving patients in bed, um, you can move them up in bed by uh, grabbing a draw sheet. Uh, Scottsdale recently has actually gone to what we call the blue tube. Um, this is where um, it actually has a double-sided uh, sheet that uh, you place into the patient and then you actually scoot them up in bed. Uh, turning in bed, you'll roll them on one side and you can um, place pillows or uh, reposition them and then you kind of roll them to the other side and do the same thing, um, which is log rolling is kind of the same thing. Uh, for friction reducing devices, again, we've got the blue tube. Um, and I'll have to probably bring that in. It's actually a pretty good idea that we recently got that before that we just used draw sheets and chuck pads. So, but still that caused a lot of friction and uh, a lot of screen breakdown for our patients. So nursing measures to promote activity and exercise. Um, you've got helping the client out of the bed. Um, the second picture is um, a lift um, that we recently got at the hospital. I think a lot of hospitals are going in this direction too. It's uh, saving on the nurse's back and, um, and we don't really use great body mechanics anyway. So this actually helps a lot. Um, use of the transfer board, which is in the first picture. Basically you're using the, the board to kind of be a bridge between the bed and the gurney. Um, we got the mechanical lift, which I mentioned, and then we got the transfer belt. Um, the transfer belt actually goes around the patient's waist and it allows them to kind of get up and you kind of use it to help them up. So uh, range of motion exercises, we kind of covered this before. Um, active range of motion is uh, the patient is actually able to do, let's say, the first picture, which is basically... Uh, lift their arm up and actually do a full range and then passive range motion um, you're actually helping them <clears throat> so assisting with the ambulation uh, may require conditioning exercises again if you you know the longer your patient stays in bed the weaker they get um, the best thing you possibly can do is get physical therapy to work with them as, as much as possible usually they'll come by once a day and kind of you know, assess what they can do and maybe walk them down the hallway, um, see if they need a walker or a wheelchair or a cane, um, some sort of assisted device to actually help with that. Um, the more we assess them and find out what they can and can't do, that determines where they go after they get discharged, whether it be home, skilled, you know, skilled nursing facility or rehab. And obtain appropriate assisted devicings. <clears throat> In here we have uh, canes, we've got walkers, and we've got braces. In here, we actually have crutches. So the uh, crutches will go under the arms and usually the elbow is slightly bent. And here's uh, crutch gates. Um, here's a big diagram as far as how to use them as far as walking. So in and out of the chair with crutches. <clears throat> Into the chair, you'll stand with the back of the unaffected leg centered against the chair. And then you actually transfer crutches to the hand of the affected side, grasp the arm of the chair with the unaffected side, lean forward, flex the knees and hips, and lower into the chair. Getting out of the chair, you're going to move forward to the edge of the chair, place unaffected legs slightly under or at the edge of the chair, grasp the crutches by the handlebars and the hand of the affected side, Grasp the arm of the chair by the hand of the unaffected side. Push down on the crutches and the chair armrest while elevating the body out of the chair. And then you're going to assume the tripod position before moving. This would be a great question asked. So what I want you to do is actually focus on this PowerPoint and learning how to use crutches. And, um, you know, whether it be one crutch or both. And what... Um, where the crutches should be, how they're positioned, how your body alignment, and how you get in and out of a bed. Um, because you, you will have patients who have either been in traumatic accidents or have done something to either break a leg, hurt one, or, or something to where they actually need the crutches in order to um, be mobile. And this is a, you know, a good way to actually learn how that works. Up and down stairs with crutches. Um, upstairs, you assume the tripod position at the bottom of the stairs. Transfer the weight to the crutches. Move the unaffected leg onto the step. Transfer your body to the unaffected leg on the step. Move the crutches and an affected leg up to the step. And the affected leg is always supported by crutches. Repeat until the top of the stairs. Going down the stairs, you assume the tripod position. You shift your weight to the unaffected leg. Move crutches and affected leg down onto the next step. 
Transfer body weight to the crutches. Move unaffected leg to that step. The affected leg is always supported by crutches and repeat into the bottom of the stairs. So I think the biggest thing you can learn about crutches is that um, the affected leg is supported by the crutch. So the crutch should be on the affected leg. It's almost as if you're replacing a leg with a crutch. So evaluating the goals established during the planning phase are evaluated according to specific desired outcomes. And if outcomes are not achieved, the nurse and the patient support person, if appropriate, need to explore the reasons for before modifying the care plan. So again, following the ADPI rule, you're going to assess your patient. Um, you're going to find interventions to actually help them. You're going to plan it. You're going to um, implement them. You'll evaluate it, and if it doesn't work, then do it all over to see if uh, you can find something different. Um, I think the biggest thing you can find or get from this PowerPoint is um, nutrition and exercise, good body mechanics for the actual nurse, save our backs, um, and try to strengthen your body so you can do this job a lot longer. And then as far as your patients, I think the biggest thing is um, remember that they're laying in bed. They're, the longer they lay, the weaker they get. The longer they lay there, the more... Um, possible disease processes they can get, whether it be DBTs or pneumonia. Um, read up on as far as what you can do to prevent those things. Um, and also, like I said, you know, do your range of motion exercises, get their strength back up, assess, assess them every time they get out of bed to find out what they can and can't do so you can plan for their discharge, whether it be home, rehab, or skilled nursing. So critical thinking, uh, how would you address your patient's concern about the risks associated with her engaging in exercise program? And your patient has experienced a number of injuries as a result of his exercise. Based on your knowledge of physical activity, which questions would you like to ask about his exercise program? So keep these questions in mind, bring any questions you have to class and we'll go over them. All right, thank you very much.